welcome to Property Summit, the show to tune into to find out all about the latest developments in the property world. I'm Emma Birchley and joining me today are six of the most experienced people in the business. Now, first off, we have Ranjan Bhattacharya, a man who's been developing and investing in property for 30 years. We also have Tony Gimple, the one in the know when it comes to tax, accountancy or succession planning. Also joining me is Nicholas Warwick, an investor, developer and author who's also the owner of the world's largest property forum. We also have Richard Bush, founder of the crowdfunding platform Crowdlords, which provides more people with the chance to invest in property. Here too is best-selling author and serial entrepreneur Paul Mahoney, a real expert in the world of buy to let And finally today, we have John Howard, a man who knows a thing or two about property, having bought and sold a staggering 4,000 houses, apartments and developments over more than four decades in the industry. Hello to you all, gentlemen. Hello. Lovely to see you Hello. again. So today we're going to look at prices in the capital, and also how they reflect prices elsewhere. So what is going on with pricing of property in London? Well, I think it's worth thinking about London and um, worth considering that London is really almost a separate country to the UK. We often talk about the UK property market and UK property prices, but what happens in London and also central London and outer London is really quite different to the rest of the country. And I think um, one thing that we've always got to remember with London is that unlike any other city, in the UK, London is an international city. When you check into a hotel anywhere in the world and you arrive at the reception desk and you see the clocks behind the wall at reception, you'll, you'll always see Paris, New York, Tokyo. You won't see Birmingham, you won't see Manchester, you won't see Blackpool, you won't see Hull, yeah, you'll see it's London. Switch. You'll yeah. see London. It's <laughs> London uh, already. is the international city you'll see when you check into any hotel worldwide. And I think um, London, has had a very interesting dynamic, particularly central London in the last few years, in terms of it hasn't really moved that much. Uh, other areas of the country have improved, um, have increased in price quite, quite well over the last few years. London has stayed relatively static, rental yields for residential property particularly low. Um, so it hasn't had any of the growth that the rest of the country has in recent years. But we also see some interesting things playing out. The fact that it's an international city, the fact that the UK currency um, is so low compared to a lot of other world currencies, the fact that people from high net worth people from around the world are looking at diversification from their home currencies um, into um, assets, you know, which can't be inflated by, you can't money print property in the same way as you can currencies. Um, the fact that um, visas and things have been given to folks in Hong Kong um, to, to, to help them settle here. And a lot of those folks choose London as a centre. So there's a lot of um, factors that mean that the people that buy, particularly in central London, the market for those properties is not people in the UK, but internationally, um, which kind of gives it a different dynamic to some of the rest of, say, outer London and the rest of the country. And I think that over the next five years, we're likely to see what always tends to happen in London, which is uh, it goes through years of not much happening. And then when there's growth in London, it's double digit. It's double digit year after year, and then it pretty much stops. And we are pretty much due um, in the next uptick of the cycle, a period of double digit growth in London, simply because there's a lot of catch up to play from years of not, not happening, not much happening. And I think the, um, some of the opportunities for invest UK investors uh, aren't in central London, the zone one areas, the you know, in places near Hyde Park and all of that, but in the ripple areas um, within the M25, but in the outer reaches. And the Elizabeth Line actually has extended those options, Elizabeth hasn't it? Elizabeth Line is going to be uh, a fantastic opportunity still. I think one thing, I mean, people often ask me, you know, what would I do if I wanted to invest in London? I think one thing that would become a rarity um, within five, six years in London is a freehold for pretty much under £500,000. You know, there are still places in the M25 where you can buy freehold properties and families like freehold properties, houses, gardens, that kind of stuff, as opposed to flats. Those sort of assets are becoming 
um, they will become increasingly rare to mm -hmm. be able to buy a freehold yeah. house with a garden in the M25 region over the next so five years. So if you years. get the chance, they're worth having? If they're, they're probably worth picking up, particularly if there's a short-term lull in growth uh, in the next year or so. But Ranjan, you're talking about, you know, yields of two or three percent. Uh, apart from one or two or quite a few selected investors, admittedly, the, the person, you know, from getting onto the property ladder now uh, to invest cannot afford to, to buy in these areas. Yeah, absolutely. It's correct. A, the, it's, the central zone is yeah. pretty much 2%. Yeah. And those are, those, the investors there are looking to uh, have a safe haven for cash. And capital. And often a safe haven for cash outside of the currency that they earn most of their money in. Yeah. And what tends to happen in those central areas is when you look at your returns over 10 years, the returns come from capital appreciation rather than rental yes, income. Yes, no, I understand that. And rental through, income yeah, washes yeah. its face and, in that. And 384,000 people last year uh, bought for the first time outside London, although they lived in London, they moved out yes, to buy. Yes. How do you feel about that? Um, well, that is happening because people get more for their money, the remote working aspects and all It's not all even that. possible though. I mean, I know someone who's trying to do exactly that, um, 30 years old, a teacher on quite a good salary and uh, partners an artist and they cannot get enough to buy their first place in London and they're in East London, they're in Leytonstone. So they're going to move out to Suffolk and go and live with the dad to raise enough money for the deposit. It is tough for people, isn't it? I mean, just people can't afford it. London is, um, it, it is, is tough for people in ordinary jobs to get a foothold. We have a, you have a lot of people in what really are quite good jobs living in houses of multiple occupation. Mm. They're not able to uh, afford their own place. And part of that, we've talked about this in, in previous programs, um, is the planning system. Uh, unlike many other areas of the country, in London there are several boroughs that impose a small sites contribution. So, like if I want to build, a, build um, three flats in Islington or Camden or Westminster, uh, I have to pay £50,000 per extra dwelling I create. It's crazy. As a, as a one-off charge to the council to help them, I don't know, maintain their town hall building or Pay change the carpet or, or whatever it is or I don't know they did all sorts of nonsense with it pay for their pensions but it's for nothing <laughs> but it makes it makes it uneconomic. Index linked. Brian for... John, a, a question on the the blue chip status of London which I agree with although I don't base my investment decisions on what's behind hotel desks uh, I do agree mm -hmm. with that London is a blue chip city yeah, and, and people yeah, want to yeah. park their money here but don't you think that mostly applies to central London? You know, places on the outskirts of London, deep East London, mm. deep West London, <coughs> they're not blue chip. Deep and darkest, yes, possibly. You know, where you it's could tube be living line. anywhere, basically. Tube line is important. Um, but what we see is the ripple effect. So when you're in zones two, three, four, and even parts of zone five, you still get a lot of um, that ripple effect. Uh, yeah, I think you'd argue that they're the better value areas. areas the further out that you can still call it Definitely. London, especially for foreign investors. If you're and, you know, and the market is driven by a lot of foreign investment parking yeah. their cash. Yeah, Nicholas, if you can yeah. have that and, and in 10 years time, it's going to double because it's still London. Well, I saw, I saw a, a development brochure that was obviously targeted overseas investors yeah. mm. and they were calling Luton London because, they, <laughs> because of the name of the airport. London Luton. Well, London they're just Luton. spelling it. Right? I, <laughs> I think you can call it Ipswich, like Ipswich <laughs> London because it's 55 yeah. minutes on the train to London God. from Ipswich. Yeah, yeah. And actually, if you're in some of these out, outskirts of Ipswich, uh, outskirts of London, you could spend more than 55 minutes. So when the, we have the high speed rail, Birmingham will be London as well, is that what we're saying? Yeah. Well, what I'm yeah. saying is, we'll just you call know, the UK London. Some of the, yeah. some of the, the more That's long distance funny. areas outside London that are called London still are actually not really London at all. No. They're not that nice an area to live in when you could, when you can go to Ipswich or somewhere like that, much better, much cheaper, and you're only an hour from London, which is probably the same distance as it takes them to get into town. What, what I think is interesting, though, to go back to your point about London being a micro market, is with uh, Brexit and then COVID and everything that's going on at the moment, rather than crashing or dipping substantially, where parts of the UK are already on, are on the decline, as we know, it's only kind of levelled out in London. So actually, will London crash at all? Will it go down at all? You know, we've had people move out because of COVID, but I think they'll be creeping back in in their droves. And I think there's huge pent up demand 
back for London. London Central, Central, Central London or, or Greater London? I think Greater mm -hmm. London as well for the people that live in England. I think Central London for the foreign investors. I think they'll flood back in in the coming two or three years. I, I disagree. I think I think the they call it you know they say it's London, but you are now forty five minutes on a tube from Central London. I think these areas are vulnerable because there's much nicer areas, better quality of life to live in, that little bit further out, and it's not much further time-wise to travel. Since COVID, to, what we have seen is that yeah. the, um, particularly the younger uh, generation, the under 35s, they're flocking back to London in their droves because the leafy well, suburbs where they're there's not just the, one they're not the only people. village they're cap not the or only whatever, people, Ranger. it's not that, you know. there's not much <laughs> happening for them. You see, there's, Ranger, the, just, London just is another a Another question on what you city. said there. You mentioned that you said and I tend to agree cycle-wise that London is due for growth, whether it's double digits or not. I think London, if you look at a cycle, it's due. It's been flat for quite a while, right? Yeah. It, it dipped yeah. and then it was flat. But how can we have double digit growth in a recession? No, we, I, I didn't say we'll have double digit growth in a recession. I'm saying that due uh, we have got a period of um, plateauing. And when we have the next uptick in the cycle, I think London will catch up tremendously because it's not just recovering from the dip that we'll see in the recession, but it's recovering from a few years of not much happening well, at but all. But isn't the problem with well. London that, because you made the point about, you know, um, Brexit and the impact that had and then COVID and the importance of external investment into London. We had a project that, that we picked up that was being funded by Russians in, in um, London and they could no longer fund it. And so, so we picked it up at a, at a good price. And my point is that the, the risk, for, I think, for central London is that it's reliant on external events. Yeah. So whether it's the people coming over from Hong Kong or whether it's no longer Russian money coming in or whatever it is, and therefore it's not really a true market because it's driven by opportunity or distress that's happening in Elsewhere. other countries, mm -hmm. counter-cyclical perhaps to our own economy. So it's really difficult to... But that's always been the case because London. Cent it is. Central it has always London, been the case. Central London's own one has always been an international city. Absolutely, but that's my point, and that's why it's always behaved separately from the rest of the market yes. because it's not part of the market. You know, it's being funded externally, it's being owned by people externally, and so on, and not even being lived in typically. So, you know, it, it's quite. A, I think it's quite a risky area for that reason. It's impossible to predict. But w whether it's overseas investors, whether it's people buying purely as an investment or somewhere to live, ultimately the, the desirability will be based around commutability, availability of work and infrastructure. Doctors, dentists, GP surgery. Th those external investors who only know London, they don't know Reading or, or Brighton. They've heard of anywhere else. They, they don't care about any of those things. They're buying because it's London and they know London in the same way as we know New York and Paris and wherever those, those clocks are from. Mm -hmm. it's, it's irrelevant whether the, the transportation is good or the infrastructure is good or the schools are good. It's completely irrelevant. Unless after they've bought, nobody wants to live there because the infrastructure isn't there. But they don't live there anyway. That's well, centre, but as a side issue, central London is one of the best places in the UK to be taken to A&E because all the specialist hospitals are within the yeah. stone's yeah. away. But that's another yeah. topic. Yeah. 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 And you will have private medical insurance <laughs> yeah. if you live private. in central London. So. Yeah. yeah. And, if, and if we're talking the ultra, the ultra 1%, they're land banking, they don't care if anyone lives in it. Yeah. No. Mm. You know, all the yeah. embassy buildings, all those huge yeah. Pall Mall, Holland Park buildings that no. are, are vacant. We went and saw a, a 25 million pound ex embassy building uh, that's up for sale at the moment, and it's been for sale for four years. They don't care, they, they do want to sell it, but they're not going to sell it cheap, and they can afford to hold on to it. Can't believe you bought the game there. Well, I was looking at it as a, a second uh, bolt hole to London. Job. Of course you were. Of course you were. <laughs> but I think the, the interesting area, Ranjan, is the area around the outside of the yes. central London, isn't it? The yes. Because that's more like Birmingham and it's well, more I think like it's more the other cities. I think it's more vulnerable. I mean, I know some smaller banks that won't lend in London. Really? They, won't, the lend, they won't develop in London. They won't lend to develop in London. Because they're cautious about the London. You know, because the happen. prices are so yeah, high. Yeah, because and the prices and also they they don't see value. Well, even um, if you're talking about Hounslow yeah, or Hackney. Yeah, or, that's yeah. an interesting point. And I, I noticed that as well. And it's a shift from five or six years sure. ago. Sure, yeah, I agree. Similar type banks would only lend in London. Absolutely. Then, and now they, now they won't. No, they all yeah. want to go to Birmingham, don't they? Well, well yeah, it, <laughs> I, you know, I, I remember seven or eight years ago, it was hard to find a lender in Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, because everything was so London centric. Mm -hmm. And now all of the major lenders mm -hmm. love those areas because they're yeah. doing well.
One of the um, great opportunities is actually in smaller developments in London, um, particularly um, <clears throat> around permitted development and converting. I thought we'd get onto that subject at some point. And <laughs> converting. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know he knew anything about permitted Converting shops and others. Oh, yeah. um, in the thirties, when the tube network grew, you had all these villages which were linked by tubes, and then over between 1930 and pretty much um, you know uh, up till up till this the, the end of the last century. What happened is all those villages became connected. So every road that connected, say, East Finchley and St. Finchley Central or whatever air tube station, whatever the road was, those residential Victorian properties on the main sort of roads became shops. So in London, every um, former village is connected to each other by masses of shops. And they're it's all in properties. Chicken, that <laughs> used to be, Church shop. all yeah. those shops used to be houses. Yeah. And we have far too many of them in London. And because of the land values, there's tremendous opportunity for taking these properties, which are in secondary parades. There, there's oversupply of these shops, partially converting them to residential use, using permitted development rules, which, which allows you, if you know what you're doing, to, to get it through the planning system far faster. and in areas, we talked about the 50,000 pound small sites contribution, um, permitted development flats that are created are exempt from that small sites contribution charge. So, and these are sites where, if you're looking at a former betting shop, you know, in some uh, East London town, you know, you're not gonna get Barrett Homes interested in redeveloping that. Whereas a smaller time developer can come in and pick that up and make two or three flats out of the thing and have a very, very nice little scheme there provided they know what they're doing. Ranjan, what's out of interest? What, what happens to the, the shop element? Uh, are, are they being converted into flats as it's well, or mixture. are they being kept? Okay. It's a mixture. It, 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 it all depends on, um, is it worth keeping as a shop or not? And that's dependent on footfall and whether So you have passing. to prove that it's not well, viable a, as a shop? In a or? conservation area, it's up to you. It, sorry, if it's not in a conservation area, you do what you want. But if it's in a conservation area, you have to do a viability statement on the impact of losing that shop. Okay. But you can make that shop smaller and put a flat at the back if you've got light. Oh, can I stop you there, Ranjan? Flat at the back, they're really attractive, aren't they? <laughs> they can be, no, they I mean, can who be. Who the hell wants to live in a flat well, with hardly any windows at the back, mm. no garden, no nothing. It only works in these parts of London, of course. It doesn't work anywhere else in the country. I was going to say, yes, would you want to live work. there if the if you did have the frontage, it's, do you want to have a flat where you've got the kebab shop next door and the betting shop well, inside? Well, it depends. You're talking about, again, it's extremes, isn't it? What you're looking at, um, are, if you're going to totally convert the shop, it's, it's, it's streets where uh, there's secondary or tertiary parades, meaning there's not much footfall. Yeah. It's, it's got that residential vibe anyway. You wouldn't do it in a street where there's lots of busy shops all over the place because no one would want to live there. Oh. So you see some of these parades where there's literally three shops and a whole everything else is residential. Those are just fantastic candidates. No, and you buy the lot I, as a I, I freehold. But, and, and in somewhere like London, people do forego desirability for location. Of course they do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, saw I, a, I think it was 15 square metre flat or something in Chelsea for 1,500 quid a month mm. the other day and the bath was in the wardrobe. Well, can I just say, <laughs> I, 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 I was looking in the window of Wait little... your bed, I mean, it brings the whole new... Uh... <laughs> I was looking in the window of a little Venice, little Venice estate agent, and there's a one bedroom flat for 2.25 million. And I thought, it just depressed me when I think how hard I've worked all my life <coughs> to have a home that's worth reasonable money, and a one bedroom You've flat really in central London. You've really got to want to live in little Venice though, haven't you, to spend but, that money on... It's all relevant, isn't it, to what you've got? But building these kind of things, you know, it's also about the rental market. Yes. It might not be about selling it. Yes. So yeah. you're always going to rent to someone that will take a less desirable area for a reasonable rent than someone buying the same flat. Mm -hmm. So a lot True. of these could be built to rent schemes, of course. Some of the properties we're talking about are actually, were actually built in Victorian Edwardian times as houses. As houses. Yes, yeah. I agree. And totally it's, 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 yes, it's commercial mm. to resi it's that, residential that's... commercial and back to residential But again. the whole yeah. reason why PD came into force was because the local authorities would not allow these shops and commercial premises to be converted uh, into residential, which is what they were in the first place. And I've been arguing for 30 odd years prior mm. to PD. It's crazy, these were residential houses they yes. bunged a single story shop on the front, basically in the front garden. And the government got so fed up with it, they said, enough is enough of this, we're going to force you to do it. And that's what they did. So 
going back on some of the other things we've covered today and in previous episodes, regardless of whether it's a PD or a shop or a small flat or the two and a half million, yeah. one bedroom in this... 2.2 million. Sorry, 2.2 yeah. million. What's 300,000 between... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's, it's a whole street. Oh, yeah. whole, oh, whole, yeah, Whoa. Just careful, the one street. Careful. Just the one street. It's, or it's a garage. It's we'll running. get lots of complaints if you say that. <laughs> and a free bee's nest to move. Sorry, yes, thank yeah, you for that's reminding right. me. My pleasure. The, the thing that's come across from this particular piece is that find your buyer first. You know, if, if you're going to develop, yes. going to go for PD, or if it's going to be for you know renting, well, hang on a second, why you know, drive yourselves crazy or somebody who wants to be into property, surely you know, start where you want to finish and that's who's going to be my buyer, who's going to be my tenant, who's going to be the commercial, etc. And if you've got that, bingo, happy days. You've pre-sold, pre-let, you know, it takes a degree of risk. Good God, I'm actually talking about How risk. How do you find someone though? Uh, do you mean someone specific or, or having a concept of who you want? Well, you've got to start with a concept. And if you can find somebody specific, so much how, the better. How, but how do you do that? You pre-sell it. Oh. Can't you ask her? Ask her okay, so if you know that you, you're going to convert uh, a warehouse into purely residential, right? well, before you even start, so, or to raise the finance, who's buying that type of property? Yeah, there think, are risks think, around that, of course, of yeah. pre-selling. Is True. That, that there are a number of people that have pre-sold developments that over the last Especially two years... Especially in London. Well, not just London, but, you know, Birmingham and other places where the cost of construction and delays with COVID and, and the market's gone up, but they can't resell them because they've pre-sold them and, and they're making huge losses. So, yeah. you, you know, it's not the answer... No, 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 it, it, no, it, no it's not the answer. Yeah. That, that, that thing was from Hitchhiker's Guide totally to the Galaxy. Knowing, yeah. no, knowing your market is the answer because, you know, when you look at a development, the first thing any, any investor or developer should be looking at is who, who is the end user? Hmm. Who's, you know, is it dinkies, double income, no kids? That's what we call them. Is it, you know, is it people, you know, um, with a bigger house who are selling it to, sm to move into a smaller property? What do you call Lock them, up John? We just call them older people like <laughs> you and me, um, who, who, who are downsizers, who, you know, who want to perhaps lock up and go because they, they want to buy a place abroad as well. Is it, is it first-time buyers? You know, you need to know your market, and Tony's absolutely right on that. And it doesn't matter if it's London, does it, Ranger, or anywhere else in the UK. That is so Absolutely. vital, is to know, you your, to know who your you're going to be selling to or renting to. So getting, getting back to the point, yes. at the moment, who's keen on London? Outer London, Greater London or... Well, I suppose, I suppose that's the difference, isn't it? Central London or it's Greater London. What I always think, whatever happens in London, happens everywhere else eventually. I, I know you're in Central London is totally different, I agree. Yeah. So take else, that out of the equation. Take out the equations. I would say whatever happens in London, it's like a wave. It goes out. So, for instance, our estate agency in Norfolk, people sell, people sell in London, sell, move out to Essex, people in Essex move to Norfolk to retire, and it's a wave. And, uh, if the, and I always think whatever happens in London happens everywhere else eventually. So I hear what you say, I respect what you say, Range, and that you don't think the market's going to drop, and that's your opinion. You've been at the job in London a long, long time, and I totally respect that, and I hope that's right. I think if it plateaus like it has done at the moment, it carries on like that, I think we'll be fine. My worry is in certain areas, aren't so nice in, outside the London, but within the London borough, if you like, of greater London, that may not be the case. The, uh, I think the, one of the advantages of, uh, particularly the last thing I talked about, where you're going in established areas yes. and looking at converting uh, shops or commercial properties to residential use, the area is already proven. You know, so, you know, uh, we're doing a project at the moment in Richmond, five minutes walk from the river. Very you know, nice. There, it, it's highly, highly desirable. Um, and it's not like you're banking on a brand new area that's um, got everything to prove and uh, it's a proven place. Yeah. So I think that's what uh, outer London kind of offers. And there is an opportunity for smaller time developers to operating niche strategies to do some interesting things. OK, well, sadly, gentlemen, we are out of time. Yeah. Thank you all very much for joining me today. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.